All right, this uh, video will consider how art is made in a very generic sense, like, you know, how, how do artists put the materials together to come up with works of art, but also how art is made in the sense that, you know, what, what, who's commissioning it, what impulses are there in society to have art, you know, who's behind that. And art is only commissioned in this age. This is not, you know, before, this is way before the modern period in which artists are creating works of art as kind of personal expression and then going out and finding people who might want to buy it. That is definitely, that doesn't come until much later in the history of art. Right now, uh, again, there are people who want art and they're commissioning the artists to supply it. Um, so who, who is doing the commissioning? Well, you probably have figured out, uh, given the art that we've seen so far, it tends to be the churches or people associated with churches, hence all these altarpieces and frescoes in chapels and things like that. Uh, and only as we move uh, into um, the latter part, the middle renaissance and then definitely into the high renaissance, the second and third part, uh, do we see the aristocrats or the wealthy in society wanting art for their palaces. Um, so again, these guys are in charge of what is being created, uh, the commissioners, the people who commission art, um, and they usually create contracts, sometimes uh, sometimes verbal, and then we have no evidence of them, but usually um, the, one, the evidence we have is from, you know, legal documents of what uh, these um, patrons are asking, these commissioners are asking of artists. And what do they specify? Well, I'm, I've given you some examples, um, which I might look at very closely at the end of this video, but, you know, these are the kinds of things they want to know. Like, what, you know, here, here artists, this is the subject I want. Um, sometimes they're very detailed and sometimes a little less so. You know, how many figures? Um, can you give me a drawing? Now, wood pulp paper only becomes uh, available only in the middle renaissance, uh, so usually it's verbal description, believe it or not. <laughs> you get these letters that tell you, you know, I want a St. Barbara that has, you know, two ears and, you know, a green garment and that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously how big it is, where the art is to go, certain materials, um, colors, the, the various pigments that go into making paint, in this case mainly tempera paint, because, um, is um, it costs different amounts of money. Uh, so certain blues, ultramarines are really expensive. Uh, so sometimes a contract will specify how much uh, blue to use, uh, this, uh, how much gold to use, that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes it will specify uh, something about the frame. And then most importantly, it will specify who does the work. So this is a reminder to us that um, these artists are not working alone. This is, uh, they're being educated um, in workshops so that a master artist has a, you know, a great many apprentices working for him and, and they're at different stages. And so when a, you see in a contract that uh, certain work should be done by the master alone, um, that suggests that, you know, this patron is being very picky. They don't want some, you know, apprentice going in there and wrecking the painting by, you know, doing X and X. So yeah, that this is, um, these are the kinds of things you see in contracts. To help you understand the contracts a little bit more, I'll just talk again very generally about how a work of art such as this one, remember this is Orcania, this is that Strozzi altarpiece, uh, the kind of mean Christ with um, saints all around. Um, this is a wood panel painting, you know that. Uh, it's wood in the background. If I were to, if we were to turn it around, you could see the wood slats on it. Um, to create, and, and there is a video at the end of this uh, module. It's an optional video under your supplemental um, sources, and you can you can see that you can see how a wood pan, you know, it's it's, it's extensive um, how these are put together. Um, they put gesso or plaster over the wood. Um, you know, just so that you don't see the cracks in the wood or the, uh, you know, where wood pieces of wood are, are, are come together, so you create a nice smooth surface, and that, that takes a really long time. Uh, then the artist will go in and draw on the gesso, so again, this is, this is a work of art of the 1300, so it's definitely before the availability of wood pulp paper, so you get, you know, drawing right on the gesso. 
and then um, and then the artist goes in with the colors. Um, gold always goes first. Uh, it is um, applied in sheets. There's this thing called gold leaf, L-E-A-F, um, and you know you, you know, they're very thin, thin, thin sheets of gold, and you um, you you know you put sticky stuff on the back and you apply it to uh, the gesso. Um, and only after you've got all the gilding in do you go back into the figures. Um, now the frames are usually done by someone else, uh, although sometimes the contract will specify that the painter is responsible for subcontracting a framer. Um, and uh, and sometimes just the frames, you can see the frames have all these little extra works in them as well. These small paintings at the bottom are called predelle. Um, they usually have scenes that are related in some manner to what's going on up here. Like, I know that this is, for example, the life of this saint, St. Thomas Aquinas. So in any event, sometimes the contract will specify who gets to do the predella images. Sometimes you can put an apprentice on something like this. Sometimes you can get an apprentice to do um, the gilding, for example. Um, but usually uh, a contract will specify that the master does the faces and the hands, the things that matter the most. This is a middle Renaissance work of art. Um, uh, you can tell because the gold disappears from the background. That's sort of one of the ma major indicators of our module three. We get rid of the gold in the background um, completely now. Um, and uh, I guess I just wanted to say the same thing. It's the same same mock-up of uh, procedures. Uh, again, the wood panel, the gesso over it, drawing right on the gesso, putting in the gold, and in this case the, there's still gold in the halos of these uh, figures who are here at the what's called the deposition taking down Christ from the cross. Um, the frame is more elaborate. Please note um, these little uh, apex, you know, things in the apex and things on the side. I don't think I don't think they're called predella, but anyway, these sub panels. Uh, a better look at uh, that painting. Uh, I don't know why I put this one in here, but it, but to show you that not all frames are as elaborate. Again, as we move into the middle period, and definitely by the high renaissance uh, we start to lose those uh, pointy kind of medieval frames uh, they get more square um, i did want to show you the gold though uh, again um, not just is gold leaf applied to the background like this it is usually applied over a red underpaint um, the red underpaint not really sure but these guys understood that having red on the behind the gold gave that red an extra sh sh shine um, in the same way that a green underpainting uh, under flesh uh, allowed for the flesh tones to be to look more realistic. I don't know. That's what the painters of the day said. Um, but in any event, uh, that is what you see, especially in this particular slide. Um, but in terms of that gold, uh, please know that, again, it's just gesso underneath this. It's just plaster that can be somewhat malleable. And so to make these kind of... Um, these these um, kind of uh, a modeled, um, uh, you know, these indent indentations or sometimes um, relief uh, on the on the gold halos or gold hats. Um, again, there's building up of of plaster or punching in of plaster, and that always that's always cool to see. Uh, I show you sort of one. It's not a great slide, but to give you some sense of a, a of a a painting that has these gold halos that sort of can read differently in different uh, lights and especially if they are you know manipulated like this so the light can either fall inside these indentations or um, yeah or on top of these reliefs this is called punch work actually when you have um, because they often use like kind of stamps to make these uh, artists had stamps to make these kind of manipulations uh, I'm not going to talk about oil and canvas. Oil and canvas is belongs to the really the high Renaissance, um, but right now we're still only working in wood panel and uh, tempera paint. 
um, some of that gold will disappear by the middle end of the middle renaissance and then we'll start to see you know again towards the end of the middle renaissance into the high uh, uh, oil paint on canvas so I won't talk about that yet but we're still seeing a lot of uh, fresco obviously and this is Giotto's um, fresco technique is again I'll put a little supplemental video at the bottom of this uh, module you can see how it's done uh, but you know again it's wet plaster so the wall is prepped by, you know, it takes a lot of time to prep that wall, um, to put that plaster in place. Um, the artists have to work fast to get the drawing done on that plaster. Again, they're drawing right on the wall and then going in. Um, so they're drawing here. Here's an example of a they're drawing right on the wall and then going in and doing a patch a day. These patches a day are called giornata, which is giornata, not Giornato, uh, which is just a, a daily a day's work in uh, fresco, um, and um, and in any event, that how this that's how this work is done. You need a whole team of people to do this. So definitely, usually for the contracts for these um, particular frescoes, you don't see any mention of you know the hand of the the master because you know it's all hands on deck when you're doing uh, frescoes.